Today we begin a three-part worship service uh, theme, and uh, we're going to look at what, what is worship. And, and I, I think so many times we just kind of take it for granted. We've been a Lutheran for a long time. It's like, hey, I knew page 5 and 15, and then they brought this other service in. Okay, and I had to learn new music and all kinds of crazy things go on. At least that's what uh, the church in uh, Arlington used to say about the second service is that it wasn't traditional and all these people did kind of different things. So we are basically tradition bound as Lutherans. And, and as most people, we are tradition bound because we like what we like and we dislike something that is new. And especially if I have to learn something on a computer that's new, I really dislike it because that means I have to learn something new. And I just am challenged greatly. So I would like to basically cement two ideas into your head this morning. First of all, worship is not one hour a week. Worship is 24-7, 365. Because God doesn't come to us and just bless us one day a week. He comes and blesses us 24-7, 365. So we have to understand what worship is. It's done in spirit. And so you're going to say, well, how can I worship the Lord 24-7, 365? Well, it's the Holy Spirit in you that is doing this with you. So you're not doing it yourself. Because you say, well, I'm not always thinking about God. You're absolutely right. But spiritually, you are in tune with Christ because he is living within you. So that's the first thing. Is Worship is more than one hour a week. But worship one hour a week is very, very important. Because we gather together to celebrate the risen Lord. Point number two, worship begins with God serving us and we in return responding to God. So worship is based upon God loving us and we then in turn love him back and give him all praise and honor and worship because what he has done for us. Because we cannot save ourselves. So if you could save yourself by going to church on Sunday, and, and let's say that just this is how God blesses you. If you go to church on Sunday, you'll have a big check next week. Okay? So do you think people would go to church? Uh, this place would be full? Absolutely. Okay? And there's some preachers that preach the prosperity gospel. That's being taught out there. But... Worship is not about material blessings. Worship is about spiritual blessings because we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. So let's begin by learning a few definitions this morning. First of all, which should be our first slide, uh, God's service to us and our service to him and to our neighbor. The Saxon word is worth scribe which means to ascribe worship to something. So uh, as English people, this is part of our heritage. And so we give honor and praise to something that we ascribe larger than ourselves, a cause, if you will. But the German part in us kind of takes that and morphs that idea into this. The German word Gottensteet, uh, which is translated as divine service, divine service is a larger term that describes God's service to us in worship and our service to him. So it's not just what we do for God, but it's based upon what he has done for us. So the relationship begins with God to us. It never begins with us to God. So God first loved us, that's what scripture says, and then we in turn love him based on the Holy Spirit working in our hearts and our lives to create faith in us. Uh, the next slide should be the Greek word litur liturgia, which in the English is liturgy. And liturgy simply is a means of service, a work or action done in the public for someone else. So liturgy, if you will, is a form of worship style that we use in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And we'll talk about that in just a moment as we talk about the styles of our worship. A second Greek word is sooner kamai, which means coming together. So worship is an act where we gather together for specific reasons. And from the book of Hebrews, we learn this. 
And let us consider how we may spur one another on to, toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So we gather together to spur, encourage each other in the faith. So, so think of, of this. If you are a Christian and you have no one to gather with, it's just you. That's it. But we should be here encouraging one another because of just physically being in the same building and hearing the same message and sharing the same gospel. And we are here as church, as united in Christ, to encourage, spur one another. And there are times when things are not going well. So in the last, three, in the last two weeks, we've had three deaths in this congregation. The Hauk family, the Welland family, and the Toby Tyler family. Okay? So that's, that's three, three in two weeks. Okay? That, that's quite a lot going on. But this family gathers together around people when there is a loss and when there is a celebration. So, for example, some of you may have heard that somebody got engaged on Wednesday. Her name is Allison, okay, our DCE. And we celebrate because this is a joyous time to talk about a man and a woman because of becoming a husband and wife in the near future. Uh, so formal worship is this. We encourage one another in our faith walk with Christ. Gregory the Great served as a Christian bishop in Rome, and this is how he described worship. The hour of the mysteries open heaven. The choirs of angels is present, and the lowest things are joined with the highest. Earthly things are joined with the heavenly, and the visibles and joined with the invisible are made one. So worship is a cosmic event. So I think so many times we think worship is here in Waxahachie, and maybe some other Baptists and other Methodists are worshiping, maybe some Roman Catholics. But I mean, this is what we, we experience. But on Sunday morning around the world, whenever it's Sunday morning around the world, it's a cosmic world event for Christians, over two billion of us, getting together to celebrate the risen Lord. It is a cosmic event. But it's not just what we see as visible, it's also the angels singing as well. And when we talk about the communion of saints in our confession of the Apostles' Creed, we're talking about those who have gone before us and those present. We are all celebrating the same one, Jesus Christ. So there's celebration in heaven, celebration on earth. It is a cosmic event that happens as we give Christ all honor and glory forever and ever. So as the body of Christ, we are ambassadors for Christ. Nikki Haley is the ambassador of the United States to the United Nations. She speaks on behalf of our country to other countries. Well, we as Christians, as part of the church, are ambassadors from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. We are called to be ambassadors for Christ. We speak to the world about the risen one who died to set us free from our sins. So I'd like to talk about elements of worship now. And basically, as we look at a worship service, it's basically the preparation phase, which we're talking about the entering into God's presence. And we just experienced that already. It is invocation, confession, and absolution. And we talked a little bit about that, is our confession is based upon faith. It's not based upon guilt. It's based upon faith. Because we already know we're guilty because none of us are sinless, but we have a sinless God who died on our behalf so that when we come, it's all about him and what he's done, and we say, Lord, there are things in my life that I don't want anyone to know about. I recognize you know, Lord, because you know all things. And uh, when we begin to look at how God knows things, uh, early church father gave this illustration. Let's just imagine your house had no roof, okay? And God is looking down from above, and you can't hide in your house because he can see what you're doing, 
Okay? So that, that was his analogy of how God knows our sin and how we then worship our Savior as Lord of all. So in the contemporary service, we have all three of these elements. So, I mean, that's pretty Lutheran, is it not? Okay? Historically. Okay? The second portion is the service of the word. You got the Kyrie, the Gloria. Neither of those things we use. Now, we may take the Gloria and put a praise song right there. That's a possibility. Okay? So that that will happen. And then we obviously have the reading of the word. We have the creeds. And we have songs, not hymns, contemporary. But you know hymns were contemporary once upon a time? And people didn't like them because they were new. You know, like Amazing Grace. That was not a number one hit the first time it was sung. Okay? But today it's an oldie but a goodie. It's something we really, really love. We always have an offering. That's kind of a Lutheran thing. But they also had an offering in uh, the Jewish time in Jesus as well. And then we have general prayers. We do not have an offertory uh, in the late service. And then we go to the uh, last part of a worship service is the service of the sacrament. We do not have a preface or a sanctus. Sanctus means holy, holy, holy. We do not have a Eucharistic prayer. Eucharistic means thanksgiving. So those three things we do not have. The preface is there. It prepares us to celebrate the Lord's Supper. The, the Sanctus basically is from Isaiah talking about how holy God is. And we are there in praising God, thankfully, that we are at his table. The Lord's Prayer is the Lord's Prayer in both services. The words of institution are the same. And peace is proclaimed. Agnes Day. Agnes means lamb. Day means God. So we, we don't sing that. But we could actually sing some kind of song that would praise God at that point in time. We do not have a post-communion canticle or a post-communion prayer. A canticle is a short uh, song. That's, that's what canticle means. I get a, a yes from Kurt, so I know I'm right here, okay? And then we always have the common benediction. Now, I can tell you in, in a uh, Lutheran service, you could actually close in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit as you begin. But the tr tradition here at this service is the Arianic blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious upon you. And the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. So we have some traditions that we celebrate in what we call our contemporary worship service. Okay, so maybe some of this is new. Maybe I've put it in a package that you've never seen before. The early church had basically five... I would call core values, and they were the apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, which is the Eucharist, giving, supporting the church financially, and then worship daily. So you have this piece of paper someplace that you receive in your bulletin. Okay, so I'd like you to ask you to take this out, because this was the first month I came here that you guys filled this out. Okay, so... You, you understand there was a responsibility of the church council, responsibility of the board of elders, responsible of the pastor, and the responsibility of the members, all right? So if you look at the responsibility of the church council, and how, we, how do we get to number one is uh, it was rated on a scale of one to five, so whatever had the lowest number was number one. So the number one was accountability to the membership of the church council. Number two was to govern the business affairs of the church. If you look at the board of elders, first was to care for the members. That was, means listening. And spiritual leadership is to model what it meant means to be a Christian. Thirdly was the responsibility of the pastor. Number one is to shepherd, lead. And number two is to lead in worship and a message. Now look at here the responsibility of the members. Worship, number one. Number two is caring for one another. And so how does this translate into the five core values of the early church? Well, you got all five, so you ought to give yourself a hand, okay? Because number one, worship, okay? That's, they worship daily, we worship weekly. Number two was caring for one another. That is, well, go back, thank you. That's fellowship, thank you. Okay, uh, number three was being involved in the congregation. 
Uh, that would also be fellowship, if you will. Discipleship evangelism is the apostles teaching because that's what we're supposed to do is go out and share. And then stewardship, uh, that's the giving. So the breaking of the bread is caring for one another and worship. Okay, so you got all five. So I just kind of want to show you what we did a long time ago is in sync with the early church of their five core values. Okay, let's go on to Jesus and the woman at the well. Jesus said, Jews, the Jews worship what we know, and to the woman, you worship what you don't know, because salvation is from the Jews. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit, and God is spirit, and true worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So let me unpack this a little bit for you. So what Jesus is saying is worship is not going to be basically tied to a geographical area. Because Jesus says, we worship at the temple in Jerusalem, and you worship on Mount Gerizim. Well, neither place is where you're going to worship because we're all going to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. So it's not about the geographical place where you worship. Jesus nixes that right away. He also nullifies the separation of Jew and Gentile because all will worship in spirit and in truth. So there is no difference between Jew and Gentile because the message comes from the Jews, but it's for all people. So worship becomes a matter of the heart and not an external experience. So it's not form of worship. So it's not traditional, it's not contemporary. Neither form is better than the other. Okay? You have to understand that what we call traditional in Luther's time was contemporary in the 1500s because he took the Roman Catholic church service and he cut out the things that were worship of saints and going through Mary and took all that stuff out and this is what we know as a Lutheran worship service. So it's 500 years old, but you go back to Jesus 2,000 years ago, he worshiped in a synagogue. So they had a very similar format because our worship format is based upon the synagogue and the Roman Catholic church. That is our worship format. Our contemporary service is based upon the traditional with some of the elements being removed. So true worship must be in spirit, which means engaging our whole heart. So it's a heart issue that we worship. It means that we have to be emotional tied to the gospel because it has to mean something to us. So we just talked about we've lost three people in two weeks. Emotionally, we were tied to these people because love ties us to people. Well, love should tie us to Jesus Christ because he first loved us. His love was so great that he dies on the cross to free us from our sin. So emotionally, we should be tied to Christ. But beyond that, spiritually, we should be also be tied to Christ because worship is more than just emotions. It is the entire being in worship to Christ. So at the same time, worship must be in truth, which means that we have to take the Bible as the word of God and Christ as his word. So the spirit without truth leads to shallow worship and over an emotional high without any content versus Truth without spirit can lead to passionless, dry experience and leads us to legalism or form of worship. So you have to have heart and head tied together, spirit and truth in worship because God is spirit. So true worship is spiritually as we bring our hearts and our minds to serve the risen Christ. And that's our definition of divine worship, is God first served us, and we in turn serve God in worship. And worship is 365, 24-7. So entering into God's presence, you will not have a slide for this, but Adam and Eve had an intimate presence with God as he walked among them. Today, the presence of God is in our baptism that Christ lives in us. It's also in our invocation as we invite 
God to be among us. Jesus said where two or three are gathered together, that's his promise. He's going to be among us. We have fellowship with God through the cross and the empty tomb, and we are invited to the very throne room of grace in prayer from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. So God has opened up eternity to each and every one of us today to celebrate the good news. In the invocation, the confession, and absolution, we enter into God's presence. This is a holy place, not because we're holy, but because God is holy. And so we do sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Because that's who Christ is. So I'm hopefully as we're going on this journey of what worship is, the first thing we're going to find out is worship is not about our preference. It's not about us. It is about Christ and Christ alone, the one who died and rose again. So I welcome you today into God's presence, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.